Hey guys, before the video begins, I would like to make a very important announcement in regards to a new channel made by a friend of mine, Kelly Productions. He has created a new channel named The Watch. It's a channel dedicated to making superhero films and miniseries of a new universe that has been created and named The Watch. And the first film is out right now. If you follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or even on this very channel, you know I've spoken about a film that's been involved that I've been involved with. Well, this is it. The Midnight Warden. I'd highly appreciate it if you guys subscribed to this channel, liked the video, turned on notifications, and shared this film with your friends so we can make more films in the future. The more awareness of our films, the more we can make. You can find a link to the channel in the description below of this video, or click on my channel and go to the section channels, and it will be there as we speak. And with that being said, guys, I hope you enjoy today's video. What's going on, buddy? My name is Elprince, and welcome back to yet another reaction video. Today, I got an SCP video that I have not seen yet. And it's also been a very long time since I've done a reaction video to SCP. It's probably been like four weeks or so since I last did a reaction video. Even though more SCP videos have been coming out, I just never got around to reacting to them because I wanted to react to some other stuff. Basically, I took a break for React to the SCP videos, which I got. I know you guys like me doing. But, I'm going to refresh that. This, this is SCP-2951, named 10,000 Years. It's not like the last one I remember watching, where it was the devil in, well, devil statue that was in the underground that got lit on fire and woke in the entity. Now, this is a different, different, this is a different entity altogether. It's, I don't think it's related at all, honestly. But we'll just have to find out, won't we? So, with that being said, guys, get right into this video in three, two, one, go. Mining is one of the most dangerous professions in the world. Got that right. While advances in technology and safety protocols have certainly eased the load that these hardened laborers endure, it still remains a daring, backbreaking endeavor. Where yeah. accidents do happen, and your safety is never 100% guaranteed. But mining is mm -hmm. also a less common profession in the United States today, with mines incorporating really? more technology and less overall manual labor. But it wasn't always that way. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, mining companies employed hundreds of thousands of workers across the country. Yeah. Before large machinery could mine surface pits and maneuver large-scale explosives from a safe distance, mining was done manually, yeah. performed by teams of thousands of workers tirelessly, slaving in the dark, digging for mm -hmm. precious resources such as coal or limestone, all while being underpaid, <laughs> overworked, and continually endangered on the job. Mines yeah. were operated by mining companies, who often took a large cut of a miner's paycheck. A 1902 account of a coal miner's paycheck claimed a $1.60 daily salary for a 10-hour shift. Even when adjusted for inflation today, that only comes out to $4.50 an hour, Jesus. which is below the United States minimum wage. And some of that money would be taxed or given to the company for providing housing for the miners' families in company towns, located adjacent to the mines. While some companies huh. were better than others in terms of safety, unionizing and demanding better pay or conditions was frowned upon, and there was always the risk of being kicked out of the town by the company if you were caught attempting to do so. Because of the hmm. demand and cost of living, boys as young as age nine worked in mine shafts in grueling conditions. This yeah, treatment was, bad was a driving then. force in necessitating child labor laws, and worst of all, Accidents in the mines were all too common in the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. Mining involves the usage of explosives to carve out new sections of rock to mine. And if something went wrong, it could have resulted in a cave-in, the complete collapse of a mining tunnel or the surrounding rock, where dozens or potentially even hundreds of miners could be injured or worse. Or killed. You had to work in complete darkness, save for a few well-placed torches, push accumulative thousands of pounds of materials every day, and contend with the ever-present risk of a gas leak, which could- How built do you think miners got back then? Like, from working in the mines all day, how built do you think some of them got? Just by pushing material up and down the mine rails, up to the surface, and then back down. Like, you're talking about thousands and thousands of pounds of rock. 
We're not talking anything like cheap. We're talking about pure rock and minerals of iron ore. Or bronze, whatever was much more valuable back then. I think it was bronze that was much more valuable. Could be actually I could be wrong. What was the most valuable ore back then? Like during like the I don't know, let's say medieval times? Was it iron ore or was it bronze? Or anything in the general what what which one was the most sought out thought out of back then? I don't know. <laughs> Could suffocate workers in a cramped, narrow shaft, or even result in an explosion when coming into contact with the materials used Eesh. during blasting. In 1917, yeah. 2,696 coal mining deaths were recorded as a result of various causes. Eesh. And that was just one year of many. The yeah. underground has claimed countless lives as a result of human greed prioritizing profits and material output over safety. Over, over safety. It's an area of nature. Safety back then was not seen as the top priority back then. Guys, people just were greedy and wanted to make money off of what they were getting. But over the last couple of uh, decades, safety became one of the top, most highest sought out priorities for, my, for workers to work where they are. I think it started in the 19th 20s, early 1920s, when safety regulations were starting to be put in for mining. I could be very wrong. I don't know much about mining. But if someone who does know, or I'll probably just look it up after this video, it's mine re safety regulations start getting important. But I'm probably, that's what I'm going to look up. We were never truly meant to interact with. And the sheer number of things that can go wrong in a mining operation proves that. Mm -hmm. With all this death, danger, and darkness, it's no wonder that the mining industry is the center of a blood-curdling anomaly that caught the attention. You know what? I forgot that this was an SCP video. And I've mostly just been ranting about mining conditions and or the last three minutes or six or four minutes. And we're already like seven minutes into this video. ...of the SCP Foundation. Today on SCP Explained, we'll be taking a look at SCP-2951. An anomaly given the elusive codename of 10,000 years. It will, as the channel's name implies, all be explained in due time. Channel or document? The year is 1944. The Lemon Quarry, a limestone mine located near Guthrie, Indiana, is like countless others in the country. It's owned by the B.G. Hoadley Mining Group, a company that would soon find themselves with one less mine to manage and a lot of information to cover up and destroy. Up until now, the operation was proceeding smoothly, with the quarry's limestone deposits providing rich beds of materials to export and sell. But all of that was about to change. On August 23, 1944, an earthquake occurred directly underneath the Lemon Quarry. Seismic activity in Indiana is strange enough, due to the area's solid limestone foundation and lack of fault lines, but it was mm. about to get a whole lot stranger. Naturally, the company sent in an exploratory team to assess the damage of the structure, fearing that the limestone deposits were caved in or destroyed in the process. Yeah, Three what about later, lives? The team returned to the surface, reporting that an important access tunnel had collapsed entirely. The tunnel was a necessary section of the mine shaft, and the company supervisors couldn't afford to lose it. So a larger team of workers were ordered to clear the debris from the tunnel using their hands and as much large machinery as they could fit into the narrow shaft. Yeah. During this operation, another strange earthquake occurred causing a tunnel to collapse behind the crew, clearing the access tunnel. Uh -oh. The quarry was sent into a panic. Another team was sent in to remove debris and attempt to free the initial clearing crew. After four hours of tireless work, they were successful, and the clearing crew was saved. But the original access tunnel was still blocked. This is when it gets strange. The crew hmm. also reported that due to the earthquake shifting the cavern, a new tunnel, one that hadn't been cut by the mining group and was not charted in the company's records, was opened. During exploration of this newly discovered tunnel, it was described as being smoothly cut and descending on a slight decline. The mining company speculated that this may have been a tunnel cut by a mining group prior to the quarry's purchase by BG Hoadley that wasn't properly recorded. They hoped it would connect around to the primary, still-blocked tunnel, and so they assembled another team of 23 men to use the new passage to access the rear of the blockage and determined whether or not to use explosives to gain re-entry into the blocked tunnel was viable. And this is where the details of the story run short. 
Sometime afterwards, there was a third round of seismic activity. This time Another collapsing cave -in? the mine's entrance tunnel. Over the oh, next boy. three days, teams above ground removed rubble and debris covering the entrance, and the company's supervisors attempted to contact the men located underground using a telephone cable line that ran into an access shaft in the mine. On the evening of the But even day, if there was a phone line going down into the mine, wouldn't have the cave in mine still part beneath under the ground itself? Why would they try and call them if the lines themselves are cut off? Day, an unknown individual emerged from the secondary shaft and made it to the surface. What happened next is unknown, but due to their collection of information regarding the Lemon Quarry incident, the Foundation discovered a single telegraph, wired from the quarry to the mining company's head offices in Louisville. It read, 26-8-1944, mine abandoned, tunnels remain collapsed, 23 lost. One of them came up the shaft, we tossed it back down, wasn't right. Sometime wasn't after right. this, B.G. Hoadley sold the quarry, where it sat abandoned for decades, and the events that occurred mm. there remaining hidden and forgotten until June 4th, 1998 when low seismic activity was detected outside of Foundation Facility Site 81. Foundation geologists were dispatched to assess the situation, but were unable to determine much information, including where the activity was coming from. Two weeks later, a missing person report was filed with local law enforcement, where a 15-year-old boy disappeared after he and his friends were trespassing in the Lemon Quarry. While search huh. efforts were conducted, the boy remained missing. But during those searches of the quarry, it was discovered that there was an unsealed shaft located beneath the mine's above-ground maintenance building that led directly into the mine itself. A rescue team was lowered into the shaft. After all, it was possible that the boy could have fell in and was still down there. But due That's to the unexpected- possibility, but because it's the SCP Foundation, that kid is long dead. Death and length of the access tunnel. The team had to wait until longer ropes and safety harnesses were available. The estimated depth of the tunnel was 120 meters. The wow. rescue team reassessed those numbers after exploring the shaft, finding them to be closer to 240 meters. Still, Eesh. the boy was unable to be found, and the rescue crews reported feeling agitated, as well as having doubts about the perception of the mine around them. The five-man rescue crew reported there being seven or eight members of the team, and one of the men reported that they were in the mine to look for gold and not the missing boy. After 43 minutes, the team went radio silent and ceased responding to communications. Above ground, the teams retracted their tether, but found that more was being retracted than had gone down the shaft. After retracting 400 mm. meters of tether, the winch was overwhelmed and came to a stop. It was these events that alerted the SCP Foundation about potential anomalous activity in the Lemon Quarry. The Foundation took control of the- Yeah, because you, because you, if the line, mine itself going down is 240 meters and you see 400 meters back worth of rope, that is not regular mine, my friend. The rescue efforts, posing as a federal search and rescue team. They were successful, somewhat, retrieving two of what? the five men, who were still connected to their tethers, but less connected to their mines. One man became <laughs> violent when he reached the surface and began to physically attack Foundation personnel believing he was still deep within the mine. The other man was originally believed to be comatose, but after 20 minutes of unconsciousness, he began speaking unintelligibly in a voice that wasn't his own. But one of the other two men he went down into the shaft with. The three other men did not surface. Two of their tethers returned with the ropes clean cut on their side. The third was clearly sliced with jagged pieces of rock and covered in human blood across a significant portion of its length. After the two men were transported to Site 81, the Foundation quickly administered amnestics to all non-Foundation personnel and developed a new cover story for the events that occurred. The Lemon Quarry was classified as SCP-2951 for the interior of the mine being subject to irregular spatial and temporal anomalies. But is it Euclid? That's something I've noticed I haven't been doing lately. SCP explained. They haven't been saying what kind of... Uh... Not only is it a safe object, is it a Euclid, or is it a cutter, is it a Thaumiel? They haven't been saying it lately. And I never know which one it is. A probe into the BG Hoadley Company and the 1944 incident was launched, and inside SCP-2951, the Foundation dispatched four members of the Mobile Task Force Trotter-5, a squad named Hell's Heroes, to further huh. analyze what was occurring in the underground. The team entered the mine through the secondary access shaft, and was ordered to spend no longer than 40 minutes in the mine. There was, though it remained unlikely, 
the slight chance that they could recover the three lost search and rescue members and the missing boy. Though the Foundation wasn't holding their breath. No, it was just well a possibility. How strange, mysterious, and dangerous anomalous locations can be. The task yeah. force descended, and after a quick mic check to determine that their recording equipment was working, they moved further down the shaft. It was dark and unnaturally deep. After reaching 120 meters, they came to a stop, an area where they could walk around. This contradicted the 240 meter depth reported by the rescue team. The task force looked for tether hooks or any other physical evidence from the original team, but they only found footprints. Moving around the dark winding area they began to explore. It wasn't long before the operatives became disoriented. Keeping in mind their 40 minute limit, one operative started the clock, and the captain ordered him to let him know whenever 10 minutes had passed. While exploring they noticed two tether lines up against a wall of rock. They took pictures and moved on, descending deeper. The timekeeping soldier reported that they clocked in 10 minutes, but the others felt like it had been longer than that. Coming to a narrow, tight mm. access shaft, the team determined that they needed to move single file. While significant time was passing, the timekeeper only reported that they had been underground for 17 minutes. Being skilled in anomalous exploration, the team members realized that there was something wrong, and that this was but most time likely move faster a temporal in the mind? anomaly. But that wasn't all. The team began seeing flashes of light in the distance and hearing noises beneath them. They made the decision to pull out of the shaft, and after moving towards the light in front of them, thinking it was from the surface, they found that they were no closer to leaving than they had been when they entered. The clock still displayed a time of 17 minutes, and trying to figure out where they were in the shaft was becoming next to impossible. As it couldn't get any worse, the team's flashlights and headlamps began dying out. Now the task force was completely in the dark, and they could only move downwards. They weren't sure where they were going, but they were certain it was going down. The sensations of the cavern were growing stronger, strange smells, something unclear written on the walls of the cave. The clock now displayed 13 minutes. The operatives began repeating themselves, stating the phrase, too long in the fire, over and over again. It was a nightmare, but the team soldiered onward, dazed by the shaft's anomalous effects. Just when they were able to see the surface light again, they noticed something. There were more members of the team than they originally started with, three of them, mimicking the other's voices, Ow. wearing their uniforms. One of the entities appeared as if it were on fire, smoke smoldering from its back, repeating that phrase over and over again. The captain ordered his men to shoot at the imposters, firing at them in the dark. But the shots missed, and accidentally hit oh. something that caused a violent combustion, causing all recording devices to cut out, and the Foundation to remove the task force from the shaft entirely. All four members were recovered and given a medical evaluation. Nice. The entities that impersonated- It seems like the, uh, mind itself finds a way to mess with time and distort mind itself around them, but also creating dupli duplications of them and it's evil versions seems like to me did and attacked the task force however were unable to be found during an interview with one of the recovered operatives he claimed that the team was losing track of time but was shocked to discover that while their recorders were active for a total of five hours and 33 minutes they only spent 19 minutes total in the mine altogether a strange anomalous time dilation effect between the surface and the underground the yeah. operative wasn't able to determine the point when the entities, clad in their armor and badges, joined up with the group. The interviewing doctor offered the operative an amnestic, but he declined, stating that he'll only need it if he's still dreaming about the entity screaming at him with his own voice months later. Yeah. While the Foundation's exploration of SCP-2951 revealed the anomalous effects of the shaft, the historical investigation also bore fruit. They learned really? the story of the what 1944 collapse that caused B.G. Hoadley to sell the mine. But they also learned another important piece of information about the Lemon Quarry. The Foundation recovered a contact list in an abandoned Hoadley office that allowed the Foundation to make contact with Gorman Ellis, a retired Hoadley investigator who was cooperative and willing to meet with the Foundation agents knocking on his door. During the interview, the Foundation learned that Ellis was originally a foreman with the company, and both his father and his grandfather were associated with the higher-ups at Hoadley. When asked about the Lemon Quarry, Ellis said that while he never worked there, he did spend time there cleaning it up after the company had shut the mine down. Ellis recognized how strange an earthquake in the area was, 
but couldn't put his finger on anything strange about the collapse. He knew they lost a few men during it, but the incident wasn't talked about much. He told the agent to attempt to get a hold of a man by the last name of Barnes, who was also involved in the cleanup, and had contacts with the company who bought out the land after Hoadley sold it. Just when the agent was about to leave, however, Ellis remembered another piece of information. The cleanup that he had worked on had over three dozen men working at the same time, but Ellis said that it was the quietest job he had ever worked. In fact, yeah, he wasn't no sure minds. if a single one of them said anything to him the entire time he was there. Mines are not at all quiet. They are always ruckus and loud. The Foundation received a number of personal documents from Ellis's contact Barnes, in the form of letters that detailed the Lemon Quarry sale to Curver International. The incident was described as a typical cave-in, but also detailed that strange men in suits appeared at the scene weeks after, asking questions and attempting to listen to the rocks according to the letter. After huh. this, Curver International, a mining group that the Foundation has so little information on that they believe it is anomalous itself, purchased the Lemon Quarry. A letter hmm. addressed to Barnes reads as follows. I saw it myself, Jeremiah. I saw something that was like a man crawl out of that hole. It smoked and burned and cried out like in a burning man. voice. It was a thing pulled straight from the pit itself. I have no doubt. A man from Geist said as much himself, that the pillars that support the world will crack and crumble, and the foundation will become loose. What lies below will become accessible, and its might will fall upon the meek. I saw it with my own eyes. I know it is true. I still hear its words, Jeremiah. Ten thousand years, screaming like a wild dog, shrieking like it was cornered. Ten thousand years in the fire. In 2003, Ellis passed away with the Foundation seizing his assets. During this process, the Foundation discovered a letter addressed to an unknown recipient, revealing that he knew more about the Lemon Quarry than he had let on. Its contents are chilling, reading, It was 23 in total. 23 of those poor boys got stuck behind that wall. We could hear them for days shouting behind those rocks while we sat around and did nothing. Have you ever been down in a mine during a blackout? Let me tell you about it. First, there is a moment of panic, when everybody scrambles to figure out what's going on. Then, as things calm down, you try to get your eyes adjusted to the dark around yeah. you. But you never get adjusted, because there's nothing to see. It's not like dark at night, where you can see stars in the moon or a street light. There's no light in a mine during a blackout. There's nothing to see down there. Then, you start to hear things. Some boys will hear voices or animals, or any number of things that just aren't there. Some will wander off and get lost. They won't follow the ropes back up. Some will fall into a shaft or into a crevice and you'll yeah. never see them again. Then it gets real quiet. I got to see that tunnel they found before the cave-in. Very strange. Didn't look dug up by tools, not proper. Didn't even have time to string up lights in it to see where it went. I don't know what's down there. Anyway, all, all I'm saying is, I haven't thought much about hell, but I sure think we deserve it. Whatever happens to those boys, as long as they're down there, is our fault. It's our fault for doing nothing. And the dark changes people. Now go watch SCP-1179 Centralian Fire Demon. Yeah, that's SCP the one I was thinking about. The Centralian Fire Demon. The one that was in the mine. I remember that one. From a video I saw a long time ago. I never reacted to it, but I saw it a while ago. It came out. Um, with that being said, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's action video it's definitely been a long time since i've done an SCP video that was a much needed refresher we to get back into the scp foundation and the universe itself uh, when i started saying stuff about somebody burning for ten thousand years i remember hearing about a u.s urban legend about a father who's consistently on fire and ran through the woods i don't know if that story is Completely right. It, it is just an urban legend after all. It's not real. Um, but then again, urban legends are based off of facts. That's what I got to say. But other than that, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed today's reaction video. Please like, subscribe, all this stuff, guys, and I will see you next video. Bye!